everybody. Um, my name's Tony. Uh, delighted you could join me today. I, I work for Impractice Systems. Uh, we develop primary care software uh, for GPs in the UK. Um, we have systems in, in community as well. And, and we're very passionate about being able to deliver healthcare uh, in a cyclical way that, that improves patient care. But having said that, it's quite a journey to get there. Uh, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit of history uh, of, of, of how that's come over the last few 20, last 20 years or so. My, uh, my first job uh, was actually working for IBM in 1990, would you believe? Um, it was in La Hope in Belgium. Uh, at their education center. Uh, now back then we used to set up the, uh, the technical labs on all the networking of the labs and, and it was a real feat uh, back then to make one computer in Belgium be able to ping another computer all the way in San Francisco and that, that was a major, you know, seen as a major step forward. The following year, 1991, uh, the World Wide Web uh, was, was born um, uh, personally, I can't believe that was uh, the 20 years ago. And I have to say, I do wonder whether the, uh, the, the younger generation of today will be uh, will that much brighter than, than we are, the, those that didn't have it when we were young. Certainly my kids are, at least when it comes to Taylor Swift's lyrics, anyway. Now, 1992 was a significant year um, for me. Uh, the, the Beginner's Guide for the Internet was published. Um, there it is, it's still there on the internet now. I brought my first um, purchase over the internet. Hands up, any of you who remembers CompuServe? <laughs> Absolutely. Now, it's, it's interesting in the 20 years, not a lot has changed because I, the, book, the first book I ever bought using the internet on CompuServe, I didn't really need then and I seem to find myself still today on the internet buying things that I don't really need now um, as well. The other interesting thing about uh, 1992 uh, was I started uh, a company called Saragon. Uh, and, and Saragon was all about delivering healthcare uh, software solutions. Um, and, and that was uh, when I was 24. I'm 45 now. Now, I know what you're thinking. He doesn't look it. He looks a lot older, yeah. In that time, um, you know, since I've been doing medical computing, uh, I've lost my hair, as you can see, uh, and I've gone grey, ongoing grey. This is me when I was one, so I didn't always look like this, honestly. This was me when I was five. Uh, look, not only did I have hair, uh, it was blonde. Uh, and this is me when I was uh, 24. <laughs> uh, and no, I wasn't a Spandau Ballet fan. Uh, although, since, since working with, in medical computing, as you can see, things have changed quite a lot. Although there is a strange coincidence, it's also the same time that I met the current Mrs. Thorne. Now, the thing about, you know, back in 1992, I was 24, I was really young and really enthusiastic. We were keen to make a big difference. We were lucky enough, we worked with the University of Dundee to build um, uh, some hospital systems. Now, of course, the thing was back then, these are, these are departmental systems, the sorts of systems where you record data about patients. So lots of data recording, lots of screens. You're able to generate some letters for patients. You're able to do some reporting and some analysis. So it's all good stuff. You know, we did it in, in diabetes and in neuroscience. We even had an early GP system. Now, these things are great, but they weren't... Yeah, they, they weren't significant in the way that they supported patient care. You certainly weren't talking about service redesign back then. You know, it, it, was, it was useful, but it was an administrative or orientated type of computing. Instead of re service redesign, again, I don't know how many of you, hands up, who remembers case mix? This was the big thing back in 1992. Uh, according to, you know, in those days, hospital management was going to be revolutionized by case mix systems and the big suppliers came in and, and you know, life was going to change as we know it. And during the 90s, not long after that, there was some really interesting developments. You know, things got a little bit more interesting. Uh, we started to uh, unlock uh, laboratory data. 
Uh, now, what was interesting then, back in the hospitals back then, hospitals didn't only have one lab system, they had multiple lab systems. What we were able to do is start bringing that data together into a central repository and make it available to GPs and to clinicians in the hospital. You know, and it was quite interesting, Tim Kelsey was talking about yesterday about how you know, he's going to make it a drive for us to, to be able to have the NHS number supported in secondary care. But a lot of this work we did with laboratory data back then was actually up in, uh, in Tayside in, in Scotland. And for about 20 years previous to, to, to this, they had um, focused on having one single uh, number for all their patients across the region. And that was one of the key drivers behind it and allowed us to, to, to create this uh, collective information and bring it together to everybody who needed it. And, and I think, you know, in some respects, I think that's been a, a, some of the reasons why IT and healthcare has been held back with not having that consistent numbering. Uh, you know, and it's good to hear that it's, it's now starting to happen. We also did some other interesting work at the same time, in fact, when uh, we were doing some test requests across a number of hospitals in Scotland, and we were doing what they call profile-based requesting. So when a patient presented, uh, rather than just doing a random set of tests, depending on what the clinician thought, it was based on the, the problem that the patient had. It would, the system would know, when you select the problem, which tests were needed to be requested. Now, this was quite interesting stuff, because they found that you know, even clinicians on the same ward in a hospital with the, same, with the same knowledge and the same experience, ended up requesting different sets of, of tests depending on, on, on who they were and, and, and even though the patient was presenting the same. So that was really good stuff. Uh, and, and, and back then, of course, we, we, you know, when we, we were getting lab results back out to GPs, it was via, there was one PC in the practice somewhere with a modem that they would dial in to get the access to this data. You know, this was, then it was seen to be quite revolutionary, but of course, you know, in this day and age, you think this is, um, you know, surely we can do better. But we're also doing things like hospital letters and discharges. And, and, and some people might say, actually, well, we've not actually moved on that much further since 1992. Jumping forward to 2000, um, things started, for me, getting a bit more interesting around this time. Because of web technology, we were able to start it, uh, involving people from different organizations together. So rather than it just being in primary care or secondary care or, or whichever care setting, we actually started building systems in, in, different, um, in different areas that allowed people to share the records. So one was, that was cardiovascular, so we were trying to reduce the number of patients who were uh, presenting with CHD and manage those patients who had it. But now we could, we could record information at primary care and at secondary care, and all the people involved in that patient's health care were able to see what was going on. Uh, same with anticoagulation. Um, we set up an anticoagulation center. Uh, the software ran centrally so that people could manage it in the practices. They, they could take the INRs in the community clinics. They would uh, change the dose there and then. The people in the hospitals knew about that change of dose when the patient arrived then. So, you know, Back then, we're now starting to get around look, looking at patient pathways a bit more consistently. It's, it's a bit more about the patient, you know, less about the administration of moving bits of paper around the NHS, more about how, how to support the patient. So this is getting, you know, getting a lot better. Then in 2005, um, IM, IMPS, the company I work for now, bought Saragon. And, um, and now, IMPS has got a long, long history in primary care systems, as many of you, I'm sure, know. Um, Vision is its main product. This is the product that GPs use every day. It's an it's a electronic system for recording all the clinical information, all the appointment type data. It's the management of the practices. Practice, you know, rely on it day to day. You know, it's quite interesting. I was at a practice recently in, in Carmarthen, West Wales. And the, the, the GP was giving me some constructive feedback on our latest release. And I said, but I must say, you know, I, you know I'm telling you all these things, but but one thing that, that, that we forget as GPs is that every day, and he said only this morning, uh, when, I, when I had a patient with me, it's the systems that remind us about the, um, the possible drug indications and the decision support that you know, I might be prescribing an inappropriate drug. So this stuff's going on every day in, in, in every practice, and it, obviously it's critical. Uh, 
more recently we introduced Vision 360, and, and that's all about pulling data together from all the different factors into a central repository. Again, as I described earlier, this is about you know, freeing up information. The health services is littered with silos of data. Um, Vision 360 helps pull all that information together in a central place and make it available to anybody that needs it. You know, an example of which is the uh, out of hour service in, in, in Wales, where all practice data gets fed up and all the out of hours uh, and emergency care centres can access that data. So again, this is now starting to make more sense from a patient's perspective. They, you know, when they dial up, they know that someone's able to access that record. It's kind of common sense to them that it's possible. Um, this makes it a reality. And we introduced some, some technology around task management. And, you know, we need to watch this space really, care, uh, really carefully. O over the coming years, I think we're going to see a massive, massive um, improvement in the way we communicate with our colleagues through this sort of technology. This is all about being able to send tasks from your practice to someone in secondary care or from the secondary care to social or social back to, to, uh, to primary care. You know, someone was, was, was saying this morning, you know, they find it very frustrating as a GP not being able to, to have a simple co uh, conversation with someone at the hospital for the specialist uh, information that they need. I do believe with this sort of technology, that's going to make a huge difference, and, and we're very excited and need to watch that space. And of course, like all the other suppliers in this area, the patient is getting the focus now, and that's the right thing to do. The ability to book your appointments online is key. The ability to get... Um, you get your, your repeat prescriptions, and by 2014, get all, access to all your information. Vision Online is our, is our solution for that. And another interesting area, we talk about integration. Everywhere I've gone in, in the conference, I've talked about integration. Integration of services, obviously, um, and making that service more seamless to the patient. You know, where does the patient start practice? Where, when do they go to the A&E department? When do they use social? Well, behind the scenes, obviously, all, the, all these systems, pe people systems, need to be pulled together with technology. You know, the banks did it years ago. Well, you, know, you can go to any ATM around, around the globe, in fact, and get your money out. That's because the, te the technical guys got together and worked out a standard to do it. Well, we've done something similar um, with, with one of our biggest competitors. So we've sat down with them and we've created a joint venture company to create a product called the MIG, which allows you to move information from different health organizations without actually knowing where they are. So in the same way you can get your money out, you can move data in different ways. And again, very significant and, and a sort of foundation stone for, um, for, for the commissioning work going forward. And then we've got um, what we call Vision Plus. Um, Vision Plus is all about how practices record and, and, and make sure that they're capturing the right information for, for their quaff. So I don't know whether you know what quaff is, but it's all about capturing the data for the uh, quality outcomes framework. And I'll touch a bit more on that later. Over between 2005 and 10, we had the national program. Lots of, again, good stuff. Uh, so getting access to make sure that your patient demographic service is up to date. The GP to GP messages is there that you know, ensures that we've got our, our practice. If I move from one practice to another, my data goes with it in a, in a consistent way. Um, choose and book, and now we renamed e-referral. You know, again, all good programs, all seem to make a lot of sense. Very much around the, 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 the um, administrative side of healthcare. You know, these things are good, they're necessary, but they're not really moving that patient journey on. And in, 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 in a similar sort of time period, IMPS, with its sister company, um, Rezeep has produced their own drug dictionary, which allows the, the, the system to do their clinical decision support and allergy checkings. With our partners, we support the, the patient conditions. And with Vision Plus, our quaff alerts. Now, I'm just going to touch on this very briefly. Um, th this is the sort of stuff that goes on in practice every day. Uh, GPs are routinely capturing this data. It is, the Department of Health set out about 32 disease areas that they're interested in catching information by. When, when your patient comes into the practice and, you, you, and you, you put in their details, you're automatically prompted to record any information related to that area, and that gets filtered back up. Here's some examples. So, you know, this is a, a, a typical GP screen. They've looked at the data of this particular patient. Some information needs to be captured, a, a, a prompt. Um, uh, appears on the screen and then they're able to record some data just like this on the screen 
and that's an everyday activity. They can even find out when the, uh, um, what information caused the uh, alert to get raised. So good stuff, that's, it, it, it's an improvement. However, Quaff isn't everything. Some data from, uh, from, from uh, NHS Lothian, GP consultations represent about 17.5% or, you know, of quaff recorded in, in, in those cases. Practice nurses record about 31% in their consultations. So overall, 78% of consultations are not in quaff. So what about the rest? What do we do with, with, the, with the other uh, incidents that are going on? So some key questions. H how do we put the patient in the center uh, of the stage? And how do, we, how do we change from repair to prevention? all the sort of things that have been coming up. We've got this aging population with long-term conditions. You know, how do we make a difference in the health, uh, the health community? How do we know that we can apply good medicine consistently across the area? You know, how do you know that your area is, 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 has got the right kind of guidelines and is applying them? And, and do we know that we're making a difference? You know, if you can't measure it, you, you can't manage it. How, how do you do that? I just want to tell you a quick story, um, a true story. It's about, uh, uh, again, uh, it's from Dr. John Steen in, in Edinburgh. Um, there's a 16-year-old boy who's an asthmatic. Uh, unfortunately, he died because he was um, overprescribed uh, a statin. Uh, and as a result of this, John um, actually dialed in to every single practice in the Lothian area. He ran a search on the GP system there to find out if there were any other patients who were in a similar condition uh, and then reported back. And, th and this is what he found. There were roughly half a million patients that, that, that he examined and looked for across the systems. Of that, those that age between two and 16, was, there was 70,000. About 10% of, of those were diagnosed with asthma. And of those, 1,317 were on this inhaled steroid. And what he was looking for was the number of patients who were being over-prescribed the, the, uh, greater than the recommended dose. And the answer he found was 16. Now, all of those prescriptions, they later found out, was, uh, had been prescribed in secondary care. But if you think about that, that's a very simple pathway, is a very simple protocol. And if there are 16 people out of half a million in the Lothian area in Scotland, how many are there across the rest of the UK? You know, and how do we stop that from happening? And surely there must be a better way, isn't there, than, than someone having to dial into all those practices to get that sort of information. You know, we really want to create a pathway, uh, get that developed, get it distributed to all the practices. The practices capture that as part of their routine information. And then importantly, we'll be able to report that back and then once it's been reported, you know, analyze it and check it and, and work it. Now, for, from my point of view, it's what I call the, the, the circle of medicine. You know, that ability for, for John to be able to say, right, you know, let, let's, create, uh, let's create the protocol, let's get it out there, let's make sure people are recording it, and let's check uh, and how, how people are doing against it. And at IMPS, what we've done is we've created a product to be able to, uh, to enable us to do that. And that product's called Pathways Plus. So Pathways allows you to, it's a suite of tools that allows you to define, define a protocol, create, a, create that um, protocol, distribute it, report on it, and most importantly of all, give you the feedback loop into um, the original protocol that you created. So I'm going to talk to you now about a slightly different pathway, um, and that's of atrial fibrillation. Uh, atrial fibrillation is the most, uh, is the most uh, you know, it's an irregular heartbeat when, uh, when you have that. It, it's what, um, you know, it's when, the, when, the, when the, the, the heart starts to um, flutter too much and you can get a buildup of a blood clot and that can cause other problems. It affects 5% of over 65-year-olds, 10% of those in their 80s. You know, it, it, it would associate five-fold increase in their stroke of risk. It's a serious problem. And again, this is from, from Dr. Christian Olden in, in, in Cardiff. Um, it's the most common reason for people attending A&E but not requiring an admission. 
So the ability to try and capture this early before, it, before patients go in is, is, you know, is, is going to be better for them and it's going to be better for the service. So by increasing the, you know, and, and this is from, from, their, from their pathway, you know, they, they're saying if they can increase the diagnosis and ma management, we can stop people feeling ill and allow them to enjoy a longer life. And of course, the, you know, anticoagulation is the key to this and treating newly diagnosed patients with AF will reduce those hospital appointments. There's lots of guidelines out there. Um, this is the, the pathway for, uh, for, from NICE. This is the local pathway. So the, 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 the previous speaker was just talking about how to implement those national guidelines as local guidelines. Well, this is a local guideline built up by the, the clinicians locally. And of course, how do you then make sure that it's been adhered to? You know, is it been done consistently? How do you manage it? How do you know if it needs tweaking? Well, with patient pathways, this is what they've been able to do. The clinicians work together with a, with a, with a uh, web-based tool that allows them to create the pathway. That then is th the technicians create the rules. That's captured. Those rules are then automatically distributed and captured by the practices. So in their everyday life, this information is being recorded. And these sorts of screens. So here, this is the atrial fibrillation one. This is what done in, in Cardiff. Um, there's the different care bundles that they created as part of their local care pathway. But most importantly of all, aggregated data is then sent up to a central um, reporting engine that allows the clinicians to see it. Now, now, for me, this is the really exciting part. This is the original care pathway that the, that the clinicians generated. And alongside, this is the information. And you can click on any part of this pathway and find out exactly which patients related to that uh, part of the pathway. So here's the feedback loop. This is me being able to say, OK, I, I can, this is a pathway I created. This is the information uh, and the patients that are affected by it. And then, of course, they can then tweak it. And here's an example of different practices data um, uh, against a particular pathway. Now, there are lots of other examples as well. Uh, referral management, end of life, dementia, and so on and so on. Uh, they're, 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 quite frankly, you can generate as many as you like. We've got some uh, uh, outside on the stand. Um, there's early adopter sites running in Scotland and, uh, and two newer early adopter sites just about to start in both England and Wales. Um, so if you'd like to know more information, please come and see us at uh, stand K60, which is literally just outside. Thank you, darling. Thank you. Now, we've got about five minutes before lunch. Any uh, questions or comments to our speaker, but also visitors stand? Is lunch the temptation? Uh, if you have no particular questions, please visit this stand because this, um, the two last presentations we've had on clinical support and, and your talk about spreading pathways are absolutely fundamental if we're going to get 